Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Taryn, as Katie mentioned, and we are going to talk about ways to manage the shoreline on the different waterfronts in Seminole County in order to improve water quality. We're going to first talk about um, oops, how to have healthy lakes. <clears> hmm. <throat> Overall, and then we're going to talk about the living things in our lakes. We're going to talk about how to landscape in the water, which we call aquascaping, and we'll wrap up the presentation talking about invasive species, um, only plants today, in your waterfronts, and how to manage those as well. This is a Florida-friendly landscaping program. Back in 2009, our legislator realized that when we add up all our residential and commercial properties, they have a big impact on the surrounding environment. And that surrounding environment might be your woodlands or your forest, but they're most definitely our waterways. So even if you're not right against the waterfront, our whole communities are having an impact on our waterways. So we need to put together nine principles to have healthy surrounding environments and healthy waterways. Our previous two webinars did focus in on pretty much um, most of these nine principles, but today we're focusing in on the last one, protecting the waterfront. Briefly, I'll run through the first eight, the first being right plant, right place. Your yard has certain environmental conditions, so you want to choose plants that are suited for those conditions. Because if the right plant is in the right place, that plant can take care of itself and will need less help from you, less inputs, such as it might not need supplemental watering. So you need to know the just right amount for your water. Underwatering can cause drought stress, but overwatering stresses out your plants as well. So watering efficiently is getting that just right amount. Mulch has several benefits. It reduces erosion, it blocks out weeds, it buffers soil temperature. As far as fertilizing appropriately, you need to fertilize with the right product at the right time in the right place because if you get any of that wrong, you're more than likely going to end up polluting our waterways. So this was the focus of our first webinar that you can re-watch and visit. We also talked about ways to recycle. Your yard trimmings can be turned into compost that can improve your soils. With your waterfront, you can improve wildlife habitat depending on the plants you have and how they're arranged. And then some of our wildlife we consider pests. So we take care of the pest without harming anything we never meant to harm if we do that in a responsible manner. Our second webinar focused a lot on stormwater runoff because this is the conduit to how we get those pollutants, that rainwater, into our lakes and streams and such. So reducing stormwater runoff is a big way to reduce the stresses in our waterways. Okay, the overall theme being, sorry, we skipped, we skipped a um, slide. Let me try to get back to that. There we go. So the overall theme of this webinar series is that what happens in your yard is connected to our waterways. Even if um, you don't live on the waterfront or you live on the waterfront, your whole community is contributing to the water quality. So fertilizing is a big one, but just reducing our nutrients overall and reducing runoff is what's going to keep our waterways healthy, as well as some additional waterfront management techniques. Because all too often we end up with um, a impaired stormwater pond. There, let's try to show you this scummy pond picture. It's there it is. So I'm sure we've seen this, um, hopefully not in our own ponds, maybe that's the case, maybe in our lakes or streams or such, or on our way home, algae, a lot of nuisance weeds, um, really reducing the overall quality of our lakes. The pollutants 
that lead to those impaired ponds are nitrogen and phosphorus, our nutrients, which may um, arise just through our lawn fertilizers or other fertilizers, or they're naturally in the soils. And when we construct new properties, we expose those nutrients all over again. Nutrients are also in pet waste. Pet waste also carries bacteria. Wet grass clippings carry bacteria so they can get into our waterways. Sediments move around as well. Different um, soil particles, um, tiny debris from our yard, dust, and what have you end up in our waterways as well as our household chemicals, oils from our cars, herbicides, pesticides that we apply to our yards. And so how do we go from excess nutrients to that scummy pond? Well, your aquatic weeds and your algae need light, water, nitrogen, and phosphorus and able to grow. So when we have an abundance of nitrogen and phosphorus, the algae has everything it needs to keep growing. And as it grows and dominates the water system, we get a reduction in water clarity. We can't see as deep into the water because algae is in the way. And when algae or aquatic weeds um, grow and die, they consume oxygen. And when they consume enough oxygen, there's not enough available for our fish, which leads to fish kills. And at this point, you have a scummy pond with a lot of dead fish. You're not really recreating in that waterway anymore. You've lost a lot of value that that waterway had. Just to go into fish kills a little more, we experienced some fish kills because of the recent hurricane. When the fish die, it's actually them suffocating. They don't have enough air to breathe in the water anymore. And algae or plants, when they die, consume enough oxygen that there's not enough available um, in the water anymore for the fish. And so we know that systems can be dominated with algae blooms and such that cause um, oxygen spikes downward and then massive plant die-offs which happened during the hurricane when those water levels got really high also consume oxygen when they die and decay. Usually warm days with little wind create perfect conditions um, for plants to spike and oxygen I mean for algae to really boom and for oxygen levels to really plummet. So a perfect set of condition leads to those fish kills. Overall, Seminole County has major waterways, but also a lot of development, and that development introduces a lot of stormwater runoff and nutrients into the environment. And so most of our waterways do become impaired from too much nitrogen and phosphorus or certain bacteria like E. coli or fecal chloroform, coliform. Let's talk about how water is entering your pond or lake or stream. One might be from rainfall directly into the waterway or that rainfall is moving through the landscape and leading to runoff. So that runoff is moving through the landscape and picking things up along the way and then entering your waterway. The groundwater, the water table might be refilling the pond or the water from the pond may be soaking into our aquifer as well. So there's that groundwater relationship. Looking back at runoff, how much runoff is entering your pond or stream or lake um, depends on several factors. Our soils are usually sandy and so we get good drainage and less runoff with our sandy soils, but we also have a very heavy rainy season where the soils are at capacity and we have a lot of runoff. Um, if we have enough vegetation, that rainfall can be captured within the canopy of our plants, slowing down runoff or decreasing it overall. But we have much less vegetation than a natural system. We have our roads and driveways, our rooftops, a bunch of what we call impervious surface where the water can't soak into the ground or be captured in vegetation. It's that it does run off into our water bodies. And steeper slopes lead to more runoff and more erosion as well. Besides the water source, we need to think about its overall trophic state. And this is a combination of factors that we'll talk about in the next slide, but 
if we take a moment and pull humans out of the equation and think how lakes naturally progress, we start off with what we call an oligotrophic lake. And these are relatively new lakes, ecologically speaking. They don't have a lot of sediment buildup. There's not a lot of nutrients. You usually have really good water clarity and fewer plants, and with fewer plants, um, less wildlife that can live off those plants. And then over time, sediments start to build up, more nutrients enter the lake. We have more plants responding to that, and with more plants, we do get greater diversity of wildlife. We call that mesotrophic. And then, naturally, this would take a very long time, hundreds to thousands of years. We get much more sediments built up, a lot of plant material, a lot of wildlife responding to all that different type of plant material, and a very nutrient-rich system. We call this eutrophic. When we bring humans and development back into the system, we created a new term called hypereutrophic. So instead of taking thousands of years to go from an oligotrophic to a eutrophic system, we've dumped a lot of nutrients and sediments into the lakes pretty quickly. We haven't had um, the plants time to respond in a very diverse way. Instead, they become these lakes become dominated with algae or the fastest growing plants, which tend to be invasive weeds. So that trophic state index or TSI value um, that you saw on the previous slide is a combination of the phosphorus and nitrogen concentrations as well as the amount of chlorophyll in the water. Chlorophyll is concentrations are basically a proxy for the amount of algae in the water. And then we do something called the Secchi depth. So we have this disc um, that we lower into the water and then we read at what level, at what depth, we can no longer see the white of that disc. And whatever that depth is, is our Secchi depth. And this is another good proxy of water clarity, how deep we can see into the waterways. This can show that we have a very nutrient rich system with a lot of algae, or there are some natural waterways that have tannins that make your water more of a tea color, and that's a natural process, um, just a result of the surrounding geography and vegetation. Our scientists, our water scientists, our environmental scientists in Seminole County are out there learning all those different um, parameters and indexes. They're also looking at the wildlife and vegetation in those lakes to determine their overall health and quality. So I'm going to do my best to answer any questions you have, but really these are the guys who know your lakes the best and can probably answer um, the really specific questions about your water body. Let's talk about the living things in a lake and how they all interact together. We'll talk about wildlife and invertebrates. We're going to skip over plankton today and go right into algae and spend a good amount of time on plants, both the good plants we want and then those invasive plants. So a waterfront, a pond, a lake make great habitat for a lot of wildlife. The frogs, the turtles, the fish, obviously this is their home. They need that water interaction. We have shorebirds that specialize in living on the waterfront. We get visiting mammals, and then we potentially have snakes making a home on the waterfront too. So here's just the quick slide, the one slide about snakes. I have to say there are no aggressive snakes. Snakes aren't going to come chasing after you. They want to get away from you and live by themselves their own lives. But I have to say that a vegetated shoreline is probably more attracted to sh more attractive to to snakes than a non-vegetative shoreline because they have more cover and potential food sources, which is a necessary part of the ecosystem. Snakes play an important role, especially in rodent control. Um, if you are terrified or threatened by these snakes, that they might be a danger to you. The most snake injuries occur when people try to handle and deal with snakes, maybe to try to 
kill them, in fact. Um, if that's your goal, call in a professional so that they know what they're doing and you're not at risk of, of being injured by a snake. And in addition to snakes, remember, it's not a guarantee that you're going to have a ton of snakes at your waterfront or anything like that, but you will have wonderful waterfowl and butterflies and other wildlife interacting with this water body. You're providing valuable habitat that our Florida wildlife really need. So here is a picture of a snake that's puffed itself up and trying to look intimidating. This is a brown water snake, um, a non-venomous snake. Most of our Florida snakes are non-venomous. That's just trying to look intimidating so you don't mess with it. What doesn't make my cell on snakes any easier is this next guy, the water moccasin, which is one of the very few venomous snakes in Florida that is present in central Florida and might like those um, aquatic conditions. So if you know you have a water moccasin and it's not a brown water snake and you feel threatened enough by it that you want it removed, call in the professional. Don't try to get rid of it yourself. Moving on to invertebrates, you might not have noticed these creatures in your waterway, but they're important indicators of how healthy your waterway is. The mayfly, the stonefly, the caddisfly, they can survive in pretty um, healthy water conditions where the water quality is at a certain level. You can see maybe the gills on this stonefly, if those gills get clogged with all sorts of sediments, it can't survive. Meanwhile, the midge and larvae and the rat-tailed maggot can survive in some pretty tough conditions. So if our scientists find very little of the flies, but a abundance of midges or the rat-tailed maggots, this is a sign that your lake's not doing too well. And then you'll see algae as a sign of the health of your waterway as well. The algae is responding to the amount of nutrients in your waterway. And we have a whole bunch of different types of algae in the world. We have diatoms, which are really beautiful if you look at them up close. You have green algae, blue-green algae. Those are sort of free-floating through the water. You have benthic algae that clings to the rocks. We don't consider algae a plant. Um, but we have benthic algae, we have periphyton, which cling to the plants. Some algae are single cells, some are in clusters, and some are filamentous. So some algae can look like a full-sized plant um, and can get very large. And you might have a mixture of all of these in your waterway. How much algae is too much? Well, we measure the amount of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the part of the cell that is green and photosynthesizes for the cell. Um, and it's an indicator for us of how much algae is present in the water. We measure it in micrograms per liter. So you, if you have less than 10 micrograms per liter, you're in a good state, you could probably see more than 10 feet downward into your waterway. If you have more than 40 micrograms per liter, you're suffering from an algae bloom and you probably can't see more than three feet into your waterway. And if that algae continues to spike um, above 100, you're at a pretty high risk for a fish kill. You treat algae by reducing nutrients. And then you can aquascape so that plants absorb those nutrients rather than algae. Give your um, waterway some good competition. You can aerate so you have a fountain or a bubbler that's cycling the water and introducing more airflow. This can disrupt the algae reproducing or it can also hide the amount of algae that you see rather than just still water sitting there with a bunch of algae. You can have dyes. The dyes will look kind of funny in your waterway, turn it a deeper like blue or green and that um, interferes with the light level so that algae can't reproduce as much or there's algicides which act like like herbicides, copper is a big one for that. To reduce nutrient inputs, you have to fertilize appropriately, reduce stormwater runoff, and have proper yard maintenance. These um, features are the focus of our first two webinars that you are welcome to check out. 
Now we'll talk about plants, the different types of aquatic plants, the impacts plants have on the water body, how to aquascape in those invasive weeds. So there's three types. The submersed plant we have here, they're rooted into the substrate of your waterway and they need the water in order to have structure. If that water level um, decrease that those plants would just tip over. They can't stand up right without water. Emergent plants are stronger. They're rooted in the soil and they are able to break the water surface and stand upright in the air. With floating plants we have two categories. Some can be rooted and those lily pads have to just flop on the water surface or we have free floating um, aquatic plants that don't root in the ground, they just float along, their roots sort of hang out and absorb the nutrients directly from the water. In order for plants to grow, they need light and nutrients as well. The light that they have um, can be decreased in multiple ways. The algae can decrease the amount of light that penetrates into the water. If you have a cloudy lake, a lot of sediments um, always churned up. That could be from the lake's shape or a lot of wind or wave action moving those sediments around. That can decrease the amount of light available or just the deeper you go into the water, the less light is going to penetrate downward. The nutrient availability depends on that trophic state. It also depends on the other nutrients already in the water or the nutrients available in the soil. So some have pretty mucky rich soils with a lot of nutrients available and some might have rocky sandy bottoms with less nutrients there for the plants. Plants have a complicated system. Um, whoops. So plants have a balance with the waterway and we want to sort of get it just right for us to enjoy. One thing that plants do is reduce circulation. So they absorb some of the wave and wind action, which is important because that will reduce erosion along the shore banks. But at your entry or exit points of the pond, you don't want so many plants that the water can't move in or out effectively. We talked about the sediments um, not being that great in a waterway and plants encourage sedimentation. So the sediment settling down to the bottom of the waterfront. This will improve water clarity, which we like, um, but as that sedimentation increases over a long period of time, the lake will start to fill in. So plants photosynthesize and when they do that they produce oxygen but we tend to forget that plants also respire like we do as animals and so when they respire they use oxygen. So at night there's no sunlight, they can't photosynthesize, they use oxygen, lower the oxygen in the water and then when they die and decompose they use oxygen as well to go through that process. So if you are ever killed a lot of plants at once, you want to consider the oxygen levels that you're probably going to have a big decrease in the oxygen levels as those plants die. Plants obviously provide a lot of habitat and food and such for fish and other wildlife. Some of that wildlife may in fact be mosquitoes. Mosquitoes want standing water. So again, the fact that some plants reduce circulation, there might be pockets that are fairly stagnant and still and mosquitoes can potentially reproduce there. But in a balanced ecosystem, most of the time mosquitoes are kept in check. You might have a lot of plants in your waterway, which leads to plant piles or tussocks occasionally. This is when those rooted plants um, get unrooted, storms, maybe fish bite through the stems, sometimes air collects beneath the soils and when it releases or burps, um, the plant roots get dislodged, chemical treatments might do this as well. So now you have this pile or tussock of plants moving around with the wind. As it starts to decompose, it's probably going to smell a bit, but it does in the meantime provide a nice little island for wildlife habitat. 
From here, we'll talk about aquascaping. So this is a big opportunity to make your waterfront more attractive, add diversity, and get a lot of benefits to improve water quality. Your pond or lakefront that's just grass than water is encouraging a lot of runoff and nutrients to enter that waterway, and the plants don't absorb those nutrients, the algae just starts to build and grow. So with aquascaping, we take a hand in the system in the design and try to get the landscape we want. Aquascaping can be very attractive. You can manage it so it looks clean rather than messy. Those plants are absorbing nutrients rather than the algae and the algae that persist might be intermingled among the plants and less visible so you still have an attractive waterway. With less algae, you improve water clarity, you reduce shoreline erosion with those plants rooted in the shoreline, and an attractive waterway is going to increase property value while a really ugly one isn't going to increase property value so much. Having the right plan in the right place saves you time and money on maintenance, and designing and getting out there and planting your plants is a pretty fun and rewarding activity overall. We encourage buffer zones where you have this zone of aquascaping. In the new fertilizer ordinance, you're not allowed to fertilize within 15 feet of the waterway. So I encourage you to go even further and not mow or apply pesticides within the 15 feet. Instead, have that 15 feet be um, aquatic vegetation, you'll reduce erosion, you'll attract wildlife, um, and filter out those pollutants. Also, keep those grass clippings away. Grass clippings degrade right into nutrients, and also try not to have pet waste right next to the water because that's going to introduce nutrients and potentially bacteria in there too. To aquascape, you need to know how deep your water is, you need to know how the water level fluctuates, and you need to consider the slope going into your waterfront. So, given our very dry drought earlier in the year and the recent hurricane, we probably have a good idea of just how dry our lakes can get and then the very high water levels too. Get a feel of where that is because some plants, like our submersed plants, never want to be exposed to the air and then our upland plants might not be able to deal with any flooding at all. So, get to know the average and what's typically your water levels and then the extreme situations as well. With the water it, um, itself, you need to consider how deep it is. Plants can typically grow one and a half times the secchi depth and emergent plants generally don't grow deeper than 10 feet while submersed plants can't grow deeper than 45 feet. So either walk into the water or get on your boat, take a stake and see how deep your water levels are so you can know what plants can grow where. So when we talk about slopes, um, you can have steep slopes or you can have gradual slopes. Um, sorry, there we go. So your gentle slopes um, is the better situation to have. You can have a lot of room to have a large variety of plants. Your shoreline is more stable, leads less to erosion, easy to irrigate and have upland plants if you need it and wildlife habitat along the way. Um, steeper slopes give you less opportunity. That steep slope is very important to vegetate, so you reduce erosion, but you might need some extra reinforcement like cloth or some stone to try to keep that soil in place. So let's run through a few examples. If you want to introduce trees to your shoreline, that would be great. Loblolly bays are a bit of a risk because the ambrosia beetle um, will attack bays. So in a way, you should plant bays because they're dying and they can use the extra help. Um, but I'm also, in that case, recommending a tree that has a high risk of dying from the ambrosia beetle. Over time, we might have more resistant varieties so that bays can make a comeback. 
Red maple are great in uplands and can handle flooding um, and it's closer to the shore bank, so they also provide some nice fall color. The Dahoon holly is attractive too because of those red berries. Do not confuse a holly with a Brazilian pepper tree. They do look pretty similar, but Brazilian pepper needs to be removed. It's a very invasive plant. Then bald cypress is basically your wetland standard for trees. A lot of bald cypress out there and the more the better. When we chop down cypress to turn it into mulch, those trees are very slow to grow back. As far as ground covers go, mooly grass is just coming out now with those purple plumes, which are really pretty um, during sunset. The coon tea is a really adaptive plant overall, can handle the wet as well as the dry sun and shade. Passionflower vine grows quickly and will spread across the ground. It has that dramatic flower and is the host plant for two different um, butterflies in Florida. Pineland lantana is another recommendation. Get Pineland lantana. There's a lot of varieties out there. Look for the yellow flowers. They're all the same color. Um, make sure you get Pineland because there are also invasive varieties of lantana out there. Beach Dune Sunflower is a pretty low maintenance plant with an attractive flower. And then that blue flag iris um, is great to handle those moist soils with that really beautiful flower as well. Getting into plants that like being in the water, we have Thalia or Fire Flag. This plant gets pretty tall, so you might not want it interrupting your view. Put it maybe on the edges of your property. And then we have canna. This is obviously a beautiful plant. Get the yellow flowers rather than the orange or red. The yellow is the native one to Florida. Pickerel weed is our standard. Um, that purple spike provides food to wildlife over time and nice and attractive. This goes deeper than the duck potato that also has a nice flower stalk and provides food for wildlife. We have the crinium or spider lily, a big dramatic plant for your shoreline. Then we have bulrush which is taller so think where you want to put it, it goes deeper into the waterway. This is just a nice diagram to give you a general idea. Plants like different water depths. So your canna should be right on the edge of the shoreline, followed by the duck potato or thalia. Um, they can be planted about a foot deep in the water. Next comes your pickerel weed. That can be up to two feet in the water. And then the deepest zone is your bulrush or if you have maiden cane. So we can help you with more plant choices and where to plant them um, to help get you going. And then we'll wrap up with invasive species. An invasive species is proven to cause harm to the economy, the environment, or human health. Most of the time invasive plants are exotic, they're not from here, but if a native plant um, really overtakes an ecosystem, um, then it might be considered an invasive plant as well. The common ones in Seminole County include primrose willow. This has a nice yellow flower, but it reproduces quickly. And Luigia, its um, scientific um, genus, has other relatives that are starting to spread rapidly throughout our waterways, so much that we have too much primrose willow and we need to cut it back. My nemesis is torpedo grass. I hate dealing with torpedo grass. It's really hard to remove because those roots are deep and extensive. And while you can pull out the blades, the root system can just grow and regenerate and the torpedo grass will come right back. It really likes those moist soils. Water hyacinth is another pretty invasive plant. Those purple flowers are really attractive, but a water hyacinth can double its population in about 12 days. So you can imagine how quickly this can overtake the waterway. Water hyacinth has overtaken the St. John's major um, boats and shipping were blocked because of water hyacinth. Um, and so, we need to reduce that as well. Water lettuce that acts similar, similarly, it's another floating 
plant that can overtake the system. Water lettuce has been in Florida for hundreds of years. We think maybe the European explorers brought it over. Um, so it's been around a long time, but it just really proliferates and can overtake the waterway. The worst one is probably hydrilla. This is a submersed plant, and if you've ever tried to have your jet ski or motorboat um, in a lake with hydrilla, you will quickly come to hate it. It really, really dominates the system, will clog up um, your motors because it grows fast and deep and large. So it can grow about an inch a day, which is pretty incredible. And if any sprig of hydrilla breaks off, it can reroute and start to overtake the system. Hydrilla is the real bear that we face in a lot of waterways. If you have like canals or wild taro on your shore bank, you can see how that also overtakes the ecosystem. This one's a little tougher to control because in Hawaii they still value wild taro. They eat the root, um, which means that we don't have aren't allowed to develop a good biocontrol for wild taro. And man, it's a little difficult to treat with herbicide. The herbicide tends to just beat off and fall off of the wild taro. So if you have any of these plants, we can work with you to try to help you remove them. Start catching them when it's a small problem because it's only gonna get more difficult over time. We remove them by mechanical, biological, or herbicidal methods. Mechanical is it by hand or with some basic equipment. This is immediate but labor intensive and realize when you're pulling those weeds, you might get the foliage, but those roots in the waterway might just regenerate and, and get those plants back to where they were after time. So you can cut them back, reduce their um, photosynthesis potential, but this is gonna very well be a repeated treatment that you have to stay on top of. Biological methods um, have living organisms doing the job for us. Some are host specific like this alligator weed flea beetle. We were able to successfully release the flea beetle on alligator weed which was causing a big problem and the beetle eats, defoliates it, keeps it in check. So now if alligator weed is in the waterway it doesn't um, explode doesn't dominate the system because of the flea beetle generally. Then we have the opportunistic types of biological controls, the main one being grass carp. Grass carp will eat anything, so that can include our invasive plants and they can help us that way, um, but they'll also eat our native plants. So it can be difficult to preserve our native plants that we want while eliminating just the invasive species with grass carp. If you're using herbicide or using a professional to put herbicide down, they're gonna use two types, either contact or systemic. Contact acts fast, but that herbicide needs to touch all parts of the plant in order to kill it. Systemic can, will, move, will kill your plant more slowly, but it absorbs into the plant, moves throughout the whole plant, and kills it that way. So our water hyacinth, for example, um, if you use a contact herbicide on that, generally the, the new plant is hidden beneath the mother plant and, and isn't as, and a contact herbicide isn't as effective at killing it. Anything that you decide to use, you need to follow the label of that herbicide product exactly. It'll tell you whether you can use it in the water. You don't wanna get any of this wrong because this is the water that we interact with and we don't wanna contaminate it in any way. And so if you're trying to manage your shoreline and perhaps remove a lot of vegetation, including invasive plants, more than likely you need a permit. If you have a dock, you have, you're allowed to have a 50-foot access corridor, but then the 
vegetation you have on either side. If you want to remove that, you are, are limited in how much you can remove. You can either remove 50 feet or 50% of your shoreline, whichever is less. So let's say your shoreline is 80 feet, you could only remove 40 feet, no more. And if you have a very big shoreline, like 200 feet, you can only remove 50 feet of that. And so you get the permit, which is free, um, through the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And a scientist is going to come look at your property, see what you intend to do, and give you really expert advice on how to design your shoreline, give you tips on how to physically remove that vegetation. So it really just gives you a good plan and a lot of explanation. So to modify your shoreline, get that permit. Following up with just a few resources, if you have a close connection to your lake or you want to build one up, I suggest becoming a Lake Watch volunteer. You're assigned to a lake, typically one that um, you live on or close to. And I think once a month you're out on your boat or your canoe and you're taking those measurements where we help determine the overall quality of that lake. You're well trained, you're part of a statewide community Community. Um, we join together once a year and talk about how our lakes are doing and from that we get really good data from you. Then if you want to check out that data or how any waterway is doing, go to seminalwateratlas.org and you can look up whether nitrogen or phosphorus are a problem in your waterway. You can see the trophic state and get a lot of resources from this website. You might have noticed in the earlier slides people wearing surf shirts. This is Seminole County's Environmental and Restoration Volunteers, a great group of people that you can join. Um, what we're going to do is mark storm drains, so helping neighborhoods know that what goes down your storm drain gets into our water. We're going to plant with different lake fronts, so getting in there with our um, feet and our shovels and getting those good plants in the water or we're going to try to remove those invasive plants as well. So it's a good time, um, a fun Saturday morning, get a group together, come on your own and, and get some good work done for the county. So those are the different resources available to you. Um, you can always contact me. You can email me at fyn at seminolecounty.gov. If you have general plant questions, you can call our master gardeners. Lake specific questions, you can run by me and if I can't answer them, I'm going to go to the county's water scientist or if you want to get involved with CERV, you can definitely email or call them as well. So from here, um, I'm ready to take any potential questions. Thank you all for joining me and attending this webinar.